Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. Good evening. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. I am not going to speak just uh, in the absence of our shikar Habibur Rahman. I have been asked to say a few words and welcome you all. And uh, this ELM and LLC uh, has been the pillar of this community, Muslim community in London, East London. So feel free at home. It's like our home. It's our house of God. And it's our community complex. So thank you to organizers for arranging this event. And um, occasionally and sadly we have to organize this sort of events. The horror of Rohingya Muslims or Rohingya citizens, in fact, those who are denied citizenship in Burma or Myanmar, they have been there for hundreds of years. In the Rakhine state, in the presence of the world international community, is really, really tragic. And this is heart wrenching. And we saw this in our lifetime in Bosnia, in Rwanda, and some other places. And this is once again hap happening in front of our eyes. And we have a lot more there who is sort of running this civilian administration. Only today, Mantutu has written to her letter. But the world is more or less um, aware of the fact that it's happening. Or who is coming to help these Rohingya Muslims? Bangladesh is overwhelmed, and Bangladesh government um, is struggling. And finance is not only a factor, it's the Muslim government. Our near neighbor has visited, the leader of the near neighbor visited Burma, and so there is a group of politics going on. But these are all the impressions and the facts that hopefully come to us, come to you. And uh, so I'm not going to speak on, on that. So welcome you, all of you, organizers, fellow speakers, and the brothers and sisters around, around uh, here. Thank you to Colonel Barry for your short welcome on behalf of the Eastern Department of the Muslim State. Can I ask, uh, get, maybe come forward a bit to make room for those who are standing? If there are empty chairs, please fill the empty chairs. Before I introduce the next speaker, I just want to let you know also this event has been streamed live with the Eastern Mosque um, Facebook. So please uh, tell your friends, message them to break and deepen their own. And also we have a Dira, Islam channel, BBC and other channels also covering the event. So hopefully the message will go internationally to everywhere. Our next speaker is Carl Buckley. Carl Buckley is a barrister at the Burnley Catholicism International Justice Chambers. Carl has been a long-term friend of various causes, whether it's Egypt, whether it's Burma and other, other you know, causes. He's always been at the forefront and we will be able to talk today to speak briefly. Uh, he will go probably a bit later on. So we'll speak and leave the uh, meeting shortly. Carl. Um, good evening and thank you. Um, I find it worrying in the extreme that yet again I have been invited to an event to deal with such issues. I'm always happy to attend, I'm always happy to speak out, I'm always happy to address these issues, but what is worrying is that time and time again we find ourselves having to hold such conferences and such discussions in the face of such atrocities and in the face of what is apparent, the international community standing idly by. 
in my lifetime we have seen Bosnia, as has already been alluded to. We see the ongoing struggles in Syria. We have seen the issues arising in Iraq, and we have seen the issues arising from Egypt. Again, therefore, the international community seems content to allow these offences to happen right before their very eyes without taking any steps. And the fact remains, as far as I'm concerned, and there will be those that disagree with me, but as far as I'm concerned, we are watching a genocide being perpetrated in Myanmar and the Rakhine state. Tens of thousands of ethnic Rohingya have been tortured, forcibly disappeared, and murdered. Over 100,000 of ethnic Rohingya have been forcibly pushed out of their homes and are desperately trying to search for somewhere where they will be safe. And it is quite apparent that there is nowhere that is really safe. Entire villages have been burned. Men, women, children have all become victims. Many of those have lost their lives in the most violent and tragic of circumstances. Those fortunate enough to survive the attacks find themselves as refugees with nowhere to go, nowhere to escape the atrocities being perpetrated by our government. And it is that government, along with the international community, that appears prepared to turn a blind eye to what is going on. Thousands have managed to cross the border into Bangladesh, yet the suffering doesn't end there. They have been forced to reside in makeshift refugee camps in a country that has made it quite clear that their presence isn't welcome. On occasion, they have been forced back over the border. The British Foreign Minister Boris Johnson has referred to the situation recently as being one that besmirches the image of Myanmar. Now, I, for one, find that comment offensive. The image of a country is not the issue, and the image of a country is not, uh, is not what is at stake here. We are dealing with the lives of tens of hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians who are being murdered. That has nothing to do with image. That has everything to do with basic humanity and basic respect for life. The Myanmar government refuses to address it. And it's a government that I was to remember, and I'm sure she'll be mentioned on numerous occasions this evening. Aung San Suu Kyi is a member of the Nobel Laureate to whom such support was given by the international community, given her long period of detention, and was heralded as a beacon for f the fight for freedom and the fight for human rights face of an oppressive and dictatorial regime. Now we hope for many things upon her release and upon her forming part of that government. And it is quite clear that those things now will not happen. Previously she made a position that neither to confirm nor deny, neither con to condemn nor support. This past week, however, the position appears to have changed significantly in that now she is blaming others for the plight. Now she is referring to the ethnic Rohingya as being terrorists. It is therefore quite plain that Aung San Suu Kyi has put herself in the exact same position as the Syrian regime and that of Assad. Those that are fighting for human rights, those that are demanding freedom, are referred to as terrorists in Syria. Now the same are being referred to as terrorists in the Rakhine state. This is simply incorrect. To exacerbate the position even further, Aung San Suu Kyi has sought to suggest that there is a significant degree of misinformation as far as reports are concerned. Now fortunately, yesterday, a BBC journalist witnessed the atrocities for himself. This is not misinformation. This is fact. The position adopted by the international community and by the government of Myanmar is wholly indefensible. There is no justification whatsoever for it. The reality is that international crimes are being committed and the world is watching what effectively amounts to ethnic cleansing. And as I've suggested before, as far as I'm concerned, it is a genocide that has been perpetrated.
The question, however, is how we address that, how we look to bring accountability and justice for the victims of those crimes. Now, the obvious suggestion, and one that has already been suggested, is that the International Criminal Court in The Hague, the ICC, must deal with the issue. Unfortunately, it can't at present. It has no jurisdiction to do so. Myanmar is not a state party to the Rome Statute, and therefore there is only one way in which the ICC can become involved, and that is through a referral by the UN Security Council. That in itself poses its own problem, as the seven permanent members of the Security Council all retain the right to veto. And as we have seen with any resolution that is tabled against the Syrian regime, Russia vetoes it immediately. My concern is that should a similar resolution be tabled against Myanmar, China will veto it immediately. That, however, remains to be seen. However, I am surprised if I am wrong. That said, justice and accountability is not to be dismissed. It can happen, but we have to pursue other avenues. The most obvious avenue at this stage is that of universal jurisdiction. I won't bore you with the minutiae of universal jurisdiction, but for certain international crimes, genocide, torture, and offences of that ilk, any country can prosecute those crimes. And many countries, by virtue of their own domestic legislation and their own constitution, are obliged to prosecute those crimes where there is a relevant victim. And it is here where we can pursue accountability and justice. What must happen, however, and again, this is not easy, but those offences that are being committed must be documented. Victims must be prepared to give statements. Those statements must be retained and given to an appropriate party, an appropriate group, so that formal complaints can be submitted to relevant domestic investigative agencies. It is not a quick process. The wheels of justice are not famous for being quick. They are slow. However, as we have seen with many other states, accountability does happen. It happened as far as Bosnia is concerned with the ICTY. Yes, it did have its issues, but it did pursue justice. It happened in Rwanda. It is happening in Cambodia. It is not quick, it is not easy, but eventually it will happen, and I am certain that it will happen where there is the relevant evidence to do so. But that is what it is based on. Yeah. I sincerely hope that the international community changes its position, because time and time again we hear the comments, never again. We've heard them since 1945 and the end of the Second World War. Yeah, the comment is entirely meaningless because time and time again we see it happening and relevant governments don't appear to be prepared to stop it and they must. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, so our next speaker of the evening will be Haroon Rashid Khan. He is the current Secretary General at, um, at the Muslim Council of Britain. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming tonight. MashaAllah, it's a great turnout. And it's been a while since we've seen this kind of a response to a cause, uh, which is really unfortunate. And we have, alhamdulillah, I think uh, Muslims in Britain generally ha tend to respond when there is a need, and I hope that you know, it leads to something really meaningful. Some of you may have seen today the MCB did issue a statement and a press release calling on the British government to move beyond tepid statements. We saw uh, some of the debates in Parliament earlier this week, and many MPs raised serious concerns about what was going on in Rohingya. I don't need to give you the facts. I think most of you have seen the, the persecution, um, the horrific acts of violence that are taking 
case. Um, so I don't need to reiterate those points to you now. And we need to move beyond those statements. Be active in saying that Burma's Rohingya community from further, protect them from further persecution, ethnic cleansing and genocide. We know from reports that they are described as the most persecuted minority on earth. Myanmar's Rohingya Muslim community have endured mass murder, including of women and children, rape and expulsion. And Burma's de facto political leader, many of us have seen her in recent days, and also when she was Aung San Suu Kyi, who was uh, herself imprisoned at home for many years. And now we can see the hypocrisy and the duplicity in her dealings with minority communities within our own, within our own country. And it's good to see that other prominent leaders have come out and spoken against this in the way that she has behaved and is failing to represent and defend the persecuted people. Especially more recently this week, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and previously the Pope, even the UN Secretary General, have all spoken out. Yet we see this Nobel laureate who's standing by the sidelines as though, you know, it's not really a problem and, and there's, it's, it's a very sort of domestic issue for them, whereas the rest of the world is looking on now as to why when we defended her and her position that now she can't defend the people of her own country and give them their due rights. We face a humanitarian catastrophe in Burma and it's imperative now for our government to act. It should exercise the UK's lever leverage to stop further bloodshed, allow observers in and humanitarian aid to pass through. Though they, they are appreciated, we need to move beyond just the statements. The statements of concern. Countries that persecute their own people, just like we do with Zimbabwe or Syria. We must act as well in Myanmar by calling for sanctions and embargoes against the, its leadership and state. Today in mosques, many of you who went to Juma, I'm sure would have heard in the khutbah the imams speaking about the situation in Burma and to pray for the people who are in need and affected by the violence. There is cross-community revulsion about what is being done to the minorities who happen to be Muslim. But this is not just a Muslim issue. It's a humanitarian crisis. I'm struck by how many people across the world are in solidarity with the Rohingyas, saddened by their plight. And really concerned about how we can come together to help them. This type of concern from right-thinking people, this kind of audience, is where we can really make a difference and take action. So what can we actually do other than just words? And I hope by the end of the discussion tonight that we really go away with some, some of these actions. What is it that we can do? One, we can write to our local MPs. We need to lobby them. Some of them have spoken out. We need to raise a strong voice. What we don't want is for the story and the cause to just fizzle out because that's the age of the media that we live in. It will live for a couple of days and eventually the news stories will die down. The advantage with social media today, you can keep the story alive. Using the right hashtags, looking up the stories, looking at who's speaking about the issue. A few years ago, some Rohingya, I met some Rohingya people and they were really struggling to bring their cause. This is not just happened recently, this has been going on for years. So now is the opportunity for us to seize and to keep the story alive. Use social media, many of you are on social media, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is. Retweet the stories. Retweet the truths that are coming out. Try not to, try to filter out some of the fake stories. There are a few around, but most of them are genuine from established media organizations. The BBC are there, Channel 4 are there. There are lots of news, story, news websites as well, so try and push as much as you can. That's, you know, the, that's the least that we can do. And also, we should help the humanitarian organizations who are providing relief. And what great work has been done by the Turkish government. Most of us have seen it, alhamdulillah, in terms of helping the Rohingya people. 
Finally, I just wanted to say, I stood here in this centre after the London Bridge terror attack, echoing the words of the Prime Minister saying, enough is enough. Well, let me say it again. Enough is enough of the killing and the ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya people. Our government needs to take urgent action and steps to put pressure on, Myanmar, on the Myanmar government to bring this persecution to a halt. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Harun Rashid. Um, some practical steps, what, what we can do. Just out of interest, how many of us here actually wrote to our MP? Hands up. Any? Not many. <laughs> it shows. How many of us actually called the, or wrote to the, uh, the Burma Embassy in the, in the UK? No. How many of us went to a demonstration recently to protest? Yeah. Alhamdulillah, few. But do you see the reality? You know, we need to be more proactive. We need to act on our words. Other things will not change. So today's meeting is very good. The house is full. There's no chairs. You know, there's no room in the room. But unless we follow it up with some practical steps, we will not see change. So the quote from Brother Haroun is very important, that we engage the social media. We contact the MP, we write the embassy, and everywhere else. Otherwise, there will be no change. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you uh, someone very prominent, most of you have seen on Channel 4, is Asad Beg, formerly with Channel 4, and also BBC. He has extensive experience reporting from various troubled areas, including from Burma and other places. So he'll now speak briefly for five to ten minutes. Asad Beg. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I think I'll be echoing what a lot of people said today, but you know, from a perspective of a journalist that's been to Burma and uh, seen the situation of the Rohingya, I just wanted to go through some of what I've seen and heard um, from them. You know, many of you will know that they have no citizenship, um, but what does that actually mean? It means that they have no rights, no right to education, no right to health, um, they live in camps, uh, dependent on aid. The movement is restricted. So before you go into the camps, uh, there's military and police checkpoints. And inside the camps, there's, there's military present. Um, and they can do as they please. Literally, these people have no rights. They do not exist. And when I went there, I think the first time in 2013, it was after the violence, there was still this sense of hope that something will change, or something will happen. Aung San Suu Kyi will come into power and you know, she, she'll do them good. But the second time I went, I saw the loss of hope. I could see it in their eyes. And they even told me they, they, they um, had lost complete hope. No one was helping them. The world had fallen silent. Um, I was walking through the camps, I was filming, and this man stopped me. He must have been maybe 50 years old. And he said to me, um, he said, we're like the walking dead. He said, we're like the walking dead. We just, we just exist. Um, and he was, you know, he, he was a grown man. I could see his ribs. Um, and he just had nothing for him. What are these people supposed to do? Young people, for example, have here have all their life to look forward to education, university, college, family. What are they supposed to do? And I came across one incident where that Rohingya women were being kept at a military base and used as sex slaves. Now sometimes like, I don't deal in conspiracy theories. I, I, I want to find out. So I spoke to the eyewitnesses and this was actually the case. There were women being kept at a military base, being used as sex slaves. Some of them had fallen pregnant, some of them had given birth. And there's nothing that anybody could do. And this is before, like, you're seeing everything on the news now. This is before then. In the second round of violence in Mongdo, I spoke to a young girl over the phone because we weren't allowed into those areas. And even now that the BBC are allowed, it's on a government-approved tour. And even then, the BBC reporter saw Rakhine burning villages and houses. And she told me how she was gang-raped. And I still remember her voice as it cracked and she cried over the phone as she told me her story and it was translated to me but I could still hear it now her, her voice and her crying 
She was separated from her family and she was gang raped by six soldiers. And this has been going on for a long time. You know, we we're talking about ethnic cleansing, but what we have to remember that there's a language to ethnic cleansing. And I witnessed it. No one knew I was Muslim there. Go there and they say, where you're from? You're from Britain. They don't expect you to be a Muslim. So the Buddhist monk would tell me, oh, these Rohingya, they, they're not Rohingya, there's no such thing. They're Bengali. They're immigrants. They're terrorists. The Buddhist monks preach to their followers that they shouldn't even kill a mosquito. But in their eyes, a Muslim, I'm not even going to say Rohingya because there's been anti-Muslim violence elsewhere in Burma, in central Burma against Muslims. A Muslim in their eyes is less than a mosquito. And I'm not making that up. In their eyes, a mosquito has more rights than a Rohingya. And there's a language to this genocide. They take people from, being from the zone of being a human to non-being. These people do not exist. The people that you are seeing now crossing the border in what is one of the maybe 21st century the, the, the mass movements of people across the border those are the lucky ones how about the people that still are inside trapped in Burma with no rights with no media there with no one there to and look at these human beings they've, they've ended up in Indonesia and Malaysia and all over the world risking their lives at sea and what have governments done we were talking about intervention when the Yazidis were being persecuted by ISIS. What are the world governments saying now to these people? And I just want to leave you with that thought. That it's all good and well for journalists like myself and others to report what's going on. And what's happening to these people. And telling you their stories or allowing them to tell you their stories or you know, being that medium. But results and action is going to come from people like you. The people have to put pressure on their governments and their MPs. If you want to see change, if you want this government to change its stance to Aung San Suu Kyi, then it's going to have to come from you guys. And you're going to have to put pressure on. Not just after today, not just in a month's time, not just in two months' time. Constant pressure. Don't forget the Rohingya. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for that. It was very emotional and moving and hopefully should motivate every single person in this room to go out and do something. Um, our next will be Mabro Ahmed. He is the founder and director of Restless Beings, which is a human rights organization in the UK. Asalaamu <coughs> Alaikum. Normally when I'm given a platform, uh, I get quite emotional, I get quite passionate, and I'm sure I've only got five or ten minutes, but I've got quite a lot to say. I could start off by telling you about the 5,000 people that have been killed over the past 10 to 14 days. Or we could talk, have a discussion about the 270,000 people who have had to cross the border into Bangladesh from Burma. We could also talk about, as Assad mentioned, the many instances of absolute heartbreak, hearing about how families have been destroyed. But I think pictures speak a thousand words, and I think almost all of us are here today because through WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the like, we've seen pictures that we should never see. We've seen images of children burning that we should never see. We've seen images of women who have been raped and the aftermath of that that we should never, ever have to witness. The inconvenient truth for the world at the moment is that this genocide is happening and as the old saying goes, the revolution is being televised unfortunately right now today the genocide is being televised and we are the viewers. We are the people who are consuming this media. A few people will come up here and we'll talk about many academic perspectives and unfortunately I don't have that capacity to talk in academic language and unfortunately I don't have such eloquence to say things in a, a way which is maybe, you know, more polite. But the reality of it is we are all sitting on our hands. Yes, there may be almost a thousand people here. 
There is a demonstration taking place outside Downing Street tomorrow. We need a thousand and more at that time as well. It's very important that we understand as British citizens in the capital city, London, we have a government who has been aiding and abetting this genocide. A government who has been funding the Burmese military. Those bullets definitely have our names on them too. It's high time that we ask our politicians, and that goes from councillors all the way up to the Prime Minister, questions, searching questions about why we are also complicit to this genocide. Why is our government in our name financing a Burmese military, a military which is basically a cross version of a junta that's been in existence since 1962? Why are we inviting Aung San Suu Kyi to the halls of Whitechapel, uh, of not Whitechapel, of Whitehall, sorry? Why are we giving her the highest of respect? Why are we referring to her as the lady? Why are we calling her door? That's the respective term. We must ask questions of the military leader as well. Minong Glang. I'm sure Mark will go into more detail in a few moments about him. At a single beck and call, he can stop this genocide immediately. He is the military leader, the commander in chief. Sometimes our efforts are misguided. Just like how Su Chi said there is misinformation about what's happening in Afghan state, we are also sometimes misguided, unfortunately. We see ages we share them. But that's where we stop. We feel anger we write the status. But that's where we stop. We feel really bad seeing some images and someone asks us for some money and we donate 500 pounds, 5,000 pounds, and that's where we stop. There is a very wide mix of people in this room, but there is a predominance of people who are Bangladeshi origin. When we talk about the Rohingya, sometimes we use the term they. They were like this. This is what's happening to them. If the borders were realigned maybe 30 to 100 miles, we would be talking about us. And if we are not Bangladeshi, and if we are Muslim, we would be talking about us. And if we go one step beyond that, and we're not talking about being Muslim, but we're talking about being a human being, we should be referring to the Rohingya community as us. And if it was our families, if it was our brothers, if it was our sisters, our children, our elderly, who are having to face the treacherous journey to come through mountains into no man's land, into a foreign land of Bangladesh, where we are not really wanted, the government is not really accepting us, where the whole entire world is watching this genocide, a silent genocide, and no one is saying anything, would we still be sitting in this room and simply sharing a picture and simply writing a status and simply giving five or ten pounds? I don't mean to make everyone feel guilty, but there are some steps for us to take. There are some things for us to do. I know human many charities. Believe and trust in your charities. If they say they are delivering to Rohingya, they are delivering to Rohingya. Whether that's in Burma or Bangladesh, is neither for you to worry about or for me to worry about. What's to worry about is those who are suffering are getting the aid that they need. Aid that our government should be giving. Considering that the lines of colonial rule are not by our government. Considering that it's our government that are giving military aid to Burma. Considering that it's those bullets have our names on it. It doesn't matter where the aid goes to which charity it goes to. Step one. Step two. There are some people that need to be called to account. Boris Johnson put on. His remarks on Saturday evening about the situation in Arakan State are pitiful. They're embarrassing. No government in my name should make a statement about a genocide like that. Aung San Suu Kyi, of course, has some questions to answer. How can she be silent 
when she's supposed to be a freedom fighter, she's supposed to be the poster girl of democracy, she's supposed to be the one that everyone across the whole world, the Western democracies, have lauded as the future of democracy, as the hope of democracy. Why is she so silent? Min Ong Liang, the military leader of Burma, needs to answer some questions. He is responsible, at least in the last two weeks, for 5,000 deaths. He is responsible, at least in the last two weeks, of 270,000 border, another 40,000 in no man's land, a further 80,000 behind them in the jungle. Almost 400,000 people. Our MPs have some questions to answer. Why are they not more vehement in their words? Why is it only three or four MPs who have raised their voices recently? If they are our representatives. That's your second step, some lobbying steps. Who can you go to? Our councillors to begin with, our MPs thereafter, join online media campaigns where other people are being called out, such as Boris Johnson and Aung San Suu Kyi and Min Aung Lang. Step three, when there is a demonstration, don't worry about who's organizing the demonstration. Don't worry about where the demonstration is. Don't worry that your jackets and coats your hats and your beards and our scarves and our clothes might get a little bit wet because we're in London and it rains. Don't worry about the police arresting you. They're not gonna. We have the freedom to demonstrate and protest in this country. Exercise it. Join in your hundreds and your thousands. Go home, there's a thousand people here today. If we all speak to our individual families alone, that is close to 10,000 people. If we share it on our social medias and our WhatsApp contacts, it's over a million people just like that. What are we waiting for? As I mentioned, we have a demonstration tomorrow at 3 p.m. at Downing Street. You are all most welcome to attend. Please bring your voices, don't be afraid of any rain. And most importantly, when you can have the opportunity, dig deep into your pockets and donate to the various causes. And please, don't stay silent. The rest of the world might stay silent, but that doesn't mean that we need to. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much, uh, Mabrur, for this very excellent presentation. And again, focusing on the practical steps that we can take. I hope everyone here most of us can attend the demo tomorrow, inshallah. Three o'clock. Uh, Downing, Downing Street tomorrow, three o'clock, inshallah. How many of us here can go tomorrow? Let's see a show of hands. More hands, please. Don't just go alone. Take your friends, your family members, your neighbors with you also. You need to make a stand. There's one on Sunday, but there's one tomorrow. Let's deal with the one tomorrow first, inshallah. So tomorrow, three o'clock. Can you all try and go there, inshallah, please? Uh, I've been asked to, for people standing at the back to come forward a bit if you can, um, because uh, people can't really enter the room anymore. We'll take a half a minute break. If it's come, to the fo come forward a bit. Bring your chairs forward also a little bit, just a little bit. Sorry about the disruption. Okay. That's it. Sorry for the cameras. I know it's not very good for the cameras. Still, it's live streamed, right? Okay. That's good. All right, can we settle down now, please? So reminding everyone, just be cordial because this has been live streamed on our, on our Facebook. It's also been covered by Jazeera Live and other channels. So um, let's keep, try to keep the noise as low as possible. Okay, so our next speaker, I'm, I'm delighted to invite now Kiri Tunks. Uh, she is the Vice President of the National Union of, of Teachers. She's kindly joined us at the last minute, so really grateful that you've made it today. Great thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much. And um, just hearing the noise of the chairs moving forward is actually you know, really nice because it shows how many people are here tonight. So fantastic turnout, and thanks very much for inviting me. It's not the first time I've spoken here, um, and that's because this is known as a centre locally where people organise things and make a stand on things that really matter. And once again, you've done that here tonight and clearly you're going to go forward doing that. So I feel really proud to be here. I'm very grateful to be here. Um, and um, I just want to bring the solidarity greetings of the National Union of Teachers here.
here. I'm here with the agreement of my General Secretary, so I'm here officially representing 350,000 teachers all around the country. And although they may not yet know a lot about this, I'm here tonight to listen and to make sure that I go back as instructed and share with my contacts and through the structures of the union what is happening and try and talk about what we can do to support the campaign for justice um, in this issue. Um, we are also just joined with a, another union, so we're about to become even bigger, and I will also take um, that, this issue into the, the, the rest of our union, the National Education Union. As the NUT, we've had a long, proud history of taking up international questions, and that isn't something always that unions are prepared to do. Sometimes unions just want to focus on their own members. But as the National Union of Teachers, we believe that international solidarity is part of being a good educator because if you can't be um, in connection with what's going on around the world how can you really teach our young people and we're not afraid of taking on hard questions I'm sure many of you will know that we've taken up the question of Palestine quite strongly and we've asked some very hard questions and we've been uh, challenged about that but we think that what is happening there and what is happening here now is wrong and we are not afraid to say that and we will keep saying that so we are um, I'm here in support but as I say I'm also here listening I know a little bit about this I've heard Heard little waverings about it but as other speakers have said for too long this is a, a situation that has been silenced and I realized today when I was reading some articles about this how little I knew or actually what I thought I knew about the Rohingya actually is completely wrong so I've been educating myself and I will certainly continue to do that um, and I think we all need to do that it's clear that Britain has a historic responsibility in what is happening here and for that reason if no other reason for that reason alone we have a duty to take this issue up and to make our government take action but we also have a present day obligation um, you know when we have a Nobel Peace Prize winner that, that when we talk about the Nobel Peace Prize as though it matters if the holder of that prize is a traitor to, the, to, to those kind of to, to what that's supposed to mean how, how does that prize mean anything how can we talk to our young people about what these prizes mean it's a bit like the British values we talk a lot about British values and what our young people must do and how they must behave and, and how they can be great British citizens and if our British values are things like equality and justice how can we look our young people in the eye if we stand silent on the question of, of, of genocide and so on as we've heard today that that would be uh, a complete betrayal of what we say we stand for so I think if we want to say that we have these values, whatever they are, whether they're British, I don't think they're particularly British, I think they're global values, but if we say those values matter to us, if we say that justice matters, if we say equality matters, if we say people's rights matter, then actually when it comes to it, we have to stand up and make sure that people are getting those rights. We must make them mean something. I just, I'm not going to talk because I'm not an expert on this question, as I've already said, and, and so I'm not going to say much more about itself but I just want us to think about another element which is our young people and, and several people already have talked about how this uh, story is through social media that's through uh, photographs that's through videos that's through reports and as we've also heard what is coming to us is horrific so our young people many of our young people are receiving this information on social media without any mediation without uh, knowing who they can talk to about it without having a safe space in which to explore things or to express their feelings and you would like to think, wouldn't you, that schools were a safe space where this kind of issue would get covered, where we would be able to um, uh, you know, talk to our young people and ensure that they've got the skills to manage uh, their emotions, but also to navigate the stories and the different things they're being told and to try and make sense of it. Um, but I'm afraid in schools, the, the space for that kind of thing is disappearing. So it is because we have become such an exam-focused sy system, there is very little space for this kind of, what I would say, real education. Education to me is more than exams and I think we are letting our children down if we do not give them the space in which to try and make sense of some of this stuff. So I hope that within all the work that you're doing that you do make some safe spaces for your young people at home, uh, here in the mosque, in the community centres because they will be trying to make sense of this because it, isn't, it doesn't make sense to any of us but talking about it and showing them how they can take action I think is really important. If you can take action then you don't feel powerless and if we all take action then maybe we can make things change. It's not just our young people. We are all global citizens. Again, all the speakers have said this. We, I, don't cons I am a British citizen, but I, don't, I consider myself a citizen of the world. I have a responsibility to people who live everywhere. And whatever rights I think I have a right to, I think everyone has a right to those rights everywhere else to speak out and act and my pledge to you today is that I am here to listen I'm here to take on the ideas everybody said I will go back to the National Union of Teachers I will make sure that my General Secretary hears a report from tonight but also our executive 
and I will see what we can do through our union to lobby our parliament uh, to, to build support for demonstrations and to try and make sure that the information about what is happening out there gets out to all our members, to, uh, to, to schools everywhere, but also to the wider media. So thank you so much for organising this. This is an amazing turnout and I feel very humbled to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Kiri Tanks and the National Union of Teachers for standing in solidarity with us today um, and being so clear and honest and I think touching on the point um, about young people and the youth and our role and importance and as well I think this is as much about educating ourselves so that we can go away and take action. So um, our next speaker is Mark Farmina and he is the current director of the Burma campaign in the UK. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you tonight. My organization, Burma Campaign UK, was founded 26 years ago at the request of people in Burma for international support and solidarity in their struggle for human rights and democracy. And one of the very first campaigns that we were involved in then was for the Rohingya when there was a military attack taking place in 1991-1992 against the Rohingya and that drove a quarter of a million of them into Bangladesh. Now what we've seen then, that took place over a period of months. You know, the last two weeks, we've seen military offensive on a bigger scale than that with more people displaced than that, a much, much larger number of people displaced. I've been at Burma Campaign UK myself for 20 years. I've never seen anything like this before happening in the country. This is unprecedented. The le a lot of people about Burma because of the 88 uprising when the students rose up. Many of you will remember perhaps 10 years ago, exactly 10 years ago, the monks were marching in the street against the military dictatorship. At those times, there was international outrage about the, the behavior of the military cracking down on the protesters in the capital, in Yangon. Now, there's virtually nothing. I've never seen such a weak response in my 20 years either to what is taking place in, in the country now. This is the worst human rights crisis the country has faced, the worst humanitarian crisis it has faced since 2008, and the response from the international community is incredibly weak. And our government is very weak on human rights generally, is very, very soft on the government and military in Burma. As we've heard, we're providing training to the military that is carrying out these human rights violations. Our has been campaigning against that training since it was launched in 2013 and I'm pleased to tell tonight we're talking about MPs and what they're doing because the government is still defending that training. I was on BBC earlier this week with Andrew Mitchell, the Conservative MP, who was saying this £300,000 training in the military is money well spent and then his next breath he admits it's not actually working very well. But 157 MPs today have released a letter, released it this evening, Rushanara Ali has helped coordinate that. We've been working with her on this. 157 MPs calling on the British government to change its approach to the military, to change its approach stopping the military training, to mobilise pressure at the United Nations, to actually start doing something about the situation. Now, the government is not listening to us alone, but if we use our voice to our MPs and our MPs listen to us, and they put pressure on the government, we can move them. I've seen it happen before. This is not impossible to change the government's approach to this. We can do it, but it does mean contacting your MP. It does mean writing them letters, emailing them, calling their office. It works, so I would urge all of you to do that, to urge your MP to put more pressure on the government, because unless we put pressure on them, they're going to continue to allow this to happen. Now, the system in Burma today is a complicated one. There's almost like a country with two governments. We had a dictatorship there since the 1960s, and they were under pressure, sanctions, domestic pressure, and they decided they had to reform, but they didn't want to give up their power. So now we have two, effectively two governments. We have the government led by Aung San Suu Kyi that everyone is talking about and all the criticism, or almost all the criticism is focused on. But under the constitution of Burma, what the military did is they handed over responsibility to her for the things they don't care about much. They handed over responsibility for health, education, agriculture, this kind of thing. They kept for themselves independence from the government.
control over the police, the security services, the prisons, and control over the civil service. So, Aung San Suu Kyi's behavior is inexcusable. I campaigned for more than a decade for her release from house arrest. I pressured the government, I lobbied, I went around the world calling for her release. I was one of the main people globally campaigning for her freedom. And I cannot believe, I'm so disappointed with how she has behaved. I've spoken to her about this myself. She did not seem sympathetic. She refused. I said to her, please go. Go and see for yourself what's going on in northern Rakhine State to the Rohingya, and she refused. So, but the pressure that she is under at the moment focused on her means the actual man who's doing the shooting, that's literally calling the shots, Min Aung Klai, the head of the military, is getting away with it. And we have to, despite our anger, our disappointment for the Western media, every day the articles is, oh, Aung San Suu Kyi this, yeah. So they might feel disappointed, we might feel disappointed, but as every time there is an article that only talks about Aung San Suu Kyi, every time people post on Facebook only about Aung San Suu Kyi, it means the head of the military is getting without the pressure that he deserves. And until people know his name, Min Aung Klai, how many people before tonight even heard of him? He's the man that's responsible for everything that has happened in the past two weeks. He's the one responsible for thousands of deaths, for the beheadings and shooting of children, for rape and sexual violence, for burning of homes. He's the man, and have you seen his name in a newspaper? Have you heard people talk about him? No. So we have to change that, because until he feels the pressure, until he feels under threat, until people are talking about him being in the International Criminal Court in The Hague, until we stop supplying him with weapons, he's going to carry on driving out the Rohingya. He's going to carry on with his policy of effective genocide, ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity. We're talking about multiple violations of international law, and he's getting away with it. Aung San Suu Kyi deserves the criticism. The criticism there's been that I've seen, I can't disagree with it. But we have to focus on Min Aung Klai. We have to focus on the military. We have to put pressure on the British government. We have to say to the British government, no more training, no more support, no more softly, softly befriending, no trying to win favors so you can sell them some military equipment despite the arms embargo. Austria and Germany supplying them with military equipment. Austria and Germany offering them training as well. Next week, in the US Senate, a bill is being tabled, which is actually going to propose spending more money and more military cooperation. The US co military cooperating more with the Burmese military, even as they're doing what they're doing. We have to change this. We have to change the attitude. Min Aung Klai should be a pariah. He should be someone that talks about on level with Pol Pot, on level with Idi Amin, with the other dictators around the world who are for their human rights violations. And, we're going to have to do that because out in the rest of the world, most people don't know what's going on. They see something in the newspaper one day, the next day it's about North Korea, the next day it's about Syria. They're not paying attention. But those of us who know what's going on, you've heard what's going on, we have the responsibility to do something about it. We have the responsibility to help them, and we can. So I ask all of you, please, make sure you do everything you can because if you don't do it, nobody else will. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, from the Burma campaign, a call to action. Uh, we'll take a short time now for public prayers. Uh, but before we go, prayers, we have more important speakers left, including someone from Turkey, Hakan Kamus from the Turkan Foundation, Dr. Nasser Tikriti from the Cordoba Foundation, and our local MP, Rukhnar Ali, will be speaking. Thereafter, there will be fundraising. I urge you all to come back after prayers, please. Resume at uh, 7.50. So we'll take a break now. For those who are praying, you can stay here and rest. Thank you. Quick interview. Uh, these guys first, and then I'll do oh, you, right? Okay, yeah, then I'll, I'll come back. Hi. Quick, quick interview. Sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. Why not? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the, I haven't uh, spoken yet. That's why. Sorry. Yeah. So, so let me just ask you very quickly. Um, t tell us why you know um, what is the scale of this um, genocide that is happening, and where do you see the role of uh, Britain? in this it's uh, obviously quite big uh, this isn't uh, a recent event it's been going on for some time the the conflict in the region has been going on since 1990s to be honest with you it's obviously uh, quite intensified recently 
it seems like uh, their final solution is to really get rid of uh, Muslims from that region. And they are actually uh, breaking every international law out there to do so. So uh, it's an ongoing genocide. It's targeted against Muslims only. Uh, you see, they're not the only Muslims in uh, Burma. There are other Muslims who live in the country. But they are ethnically cleansing that region from uh, the people who live there. So it's a policy, the government policy they're implementing. And uh, unless the world really gets up and does something about it, they will not stop until they finish what they're trying to achieve uh, in the region. So far, Costa... Did, did, you, did you see the uh, BBC and CNN coverage of the Suki election? I did, uh, you, which, you is, did. which is uh, quite uh, interesting how they actually portray her still. I mean... Uh, but, uh, did you notice that they didn't even raise it for a single time that the Muslims were not allowed to vote? They were not treated as a citizen, even though they lived there for 600 years. It's quite a long time, in fact. I can say, and not only that, I could actually say, uh, one of the interviewers, do you remember, the previous interview was conducted by a Muslim uh, from BBC, and she was really, uh, uh, she was really uh, offended by it, because the interviewer from BBC was Muslim. Do you see how they're actually trying to create such a uh, divisive uh, society in there by showing the hatred they have for Muslims in that region, including Ansu Nsi, it doesn't matter who it is. They actually have such a hatred for them. Please introduce our viewers yourself. My name is Hakan Kamus. I'm the chairman of Tukan Foundation. Thanks for meeting you. Thank you, Hakan. Uh, we are going to quickly catch with. Bari Bai, could, could we have a quick interview with you? Bangla, English, whichever you prefer. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, by the way, you had a very short speech in the beginning. Uh, tell, tell us something, your feelings about what's happening and where is really the solution? How, how can the Rohingya Muslims, what can everybody do, whether here or in Bangladesh? Where, what is the role of Britain? I mean, there is a lot of things happening at the moment. And uh, where is the fate of Rohingya going to end? Well, fate of Rohingya Muslim is very difficult to say because the global politics is working in here. And many Western countries, including our, go our government, uh, are giving military aid uh, to uh, Burmese military junta. Unless these are stopped and the governments put pressure on the Burmese government, uh, it's very difficult to say what, what, what happens. Suki or Suchi is just one figure and of course there should be pressure. And I think at the end of the day it's the military, Burmese military junta which is making this decision. Suchi herself should should have raised her voice. But I think as ordinary people in the streets or in Britain, we should raise our voice as loudly as possible and um, talk to our MPs and put pressure on our government so that they put pressure on the Burmese government, they stop trading uh, with arms. That's my... That's, that's my so there, there, there is the arms conference happening actually starting very in a few days or a few weeks in the Excel Center. Go in the, in, into this conference and ma make a protest, but the problem is, it's the government that sends ar uh, sends sends arms to uh, another government. So these are the the arm arm ex ex uh, these exhibitions uh, happening in Excel, these, right? These right now, are the, are just the they, they are just pro promoters. But at the end of the day, these are the governments. Western governments are still supplying arms to the Burmese military junta. That's the main problem. And if Burmese Danta knows that go Western governments are going to stop, then probably things will, will, will change. But I don't know whether... A little bit of uh, LB20. We are from LB24 TV. Okay. Um, so we are speaking with Dr. Bari, who is um, who is a very prominent figure in the Bangladeshi Muslim community in the UK. Um, so Bari, Bari coming, coming back to the question of so th th these arms trading are happening and the exhibitions are happening, and the government is selling arms. I mean, they're selling arms to Burma, they're selling arms to Saudi, and we know it's the Rohingyas on one side, and then you have the Yemenis on the other side. Uh, 
it's, it's really uh, the Muslim community needs to come together. Where are the Muslim uh, community institutions? Um, they need to raise a stronger voice. Well, Muslim community and institutions in the West, especially in Britain, we are not that powerful. That's one, one area. It's the problem is the whole Muslim world is in paralysis. If the Muslim governments, majority Muslim governments, in the name of OIC or individually, like Turkey has been doing, would have spoken up, would have talked to the UN, would have, would have spoken with the, with the global powers, things would have changed. Unfortunately, Muslim, global Muslim leadership is in paralysis. So what we have to do as ordinary citizens is to raise our voice and talk with our own MPs and put pressure on our government so that at least our government takes some initiative. They, our government stops supplying arms and our government takes a moral leadership and talks to other governments because it's a security, power, a security council member. Then there is some possibility. Unfortunately, global politics is going on and, and uh, that's, that's another unfortunate thing. Thank you very much, Bari, Bari, Mr. Bari, for your time. Thank you. Uh, we are going to now find some more people to uh, the people who are attending and uh, presenting in the uh, program. Um, we let's let's just uh, find someone. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, speech. Uh, could you please introduce yourself? Sorry. Well, my name is My name is Mark Farmer. I'm director at Burma Campaign UK. Right, uh, Mark. Can you please uh, tell us? In when Suki election happened, we saw BBC, CNN, and many uh, media covered the election, but no one raised the fact that Muslims in Burma couldn't vote. Uh, why Why wasn't it raised? Why was it overlooked well, from that time? Well, the Rohingya Muslims were deprived the right to vote. Um, a lot of other Muslims in the country who are not Rohingya were able to vote. I think, but what was worrying is that Aung San Suu Kyi had decided not to field any Muslim candidates. Um, and once she was in government, she didn't appoint any Muslim ministers. No, there was a theory that she wasn't talking about um, anti-Muslim sentiment because it's so endemic in the country. She was worried about leave, losing votes. But after the election and she'd won a landslide, there was no reason for her not to appoint any Muslim members of her government, but she chose not to do that either. What, what is happening from a geopolitical point of view? Because there is a lot of views that it is about uh, the energy, the resources, but to, to get the energy or resources, you don't need to do ethnic cleansing, do you? Energy resources is about business, it's not about race. Yeah, I mean, they're going to create a special economic zone where the Rohingya are and there's gas reserves, but. They can just put, and they've done it to other ethnic groups in the Burma, they just put a pipeline right through their village. They don't care. This is about ethnicity and this is about religion. Um, there is a perception you know, among many people in Burma that Muslims are foreign, that they arrived in Burma in colonial times and that was a time of humiliation and that they, they don't... And, and when you say colonial time, which time do you mean? The 18th, 19th century? We're, we're talking of roughly 1824 to the post-war, post-Second World War period when Burma gained its independence. But the history suggests that they have been there since the 14th, 15th century. Absolutely, but what, what you had for a long time since 1962 is a military dictatorship that tried to justify its existence by being defenders of the race and religion and casting other ethnic people, not, ju not just the Rohingya, but Karen, Shan, Kachin, Kareni, other ethnic minorities as, the, as foreign and the enemy. And very, very quickly, are you going to um, go and demonstrate protest against the selling of arms to Burmese government by the UK? We've been campaigning against, well, it's not the selling of arms that we know of. They're selling, they might be supplying military equipment. They are providing military training. We've been campaigning against that since, since 2013. We're working with MPs now. We've got uh, like nearly 200 MPs backing the campaign. Uh, anyone that should be contacting their MP saying back this campaign, put pressure on the government. Mark, sorry, I have to cut it short. I have to take interviews. Mong, hi, how are you doing? Hi, hello, how are you? Doing well? Uh, Thank so you. So, Mong, Mong Tung King. Mong Tung King, please introduce yourself. 
Uh, my name is Tunkin Gaffar, president of Burmese Rohingya Organization UK. Uh, I was born and brought up in Arkana State, western part of Burma. I, I'm living in UK about 14 years now. Tun King, tell us about, um, you know, the, the, these things are happening for quite a very long time. Um, you, you haven't had a, um, an armed struggle against the Burmese junta. Um, do, are the, is there a plan to uh, declare an independence or anything of that nature from the um, Rohingyas? I don't think uh, we are demanding any state or anything. We are, because uh, we are requesting, we are urging international community appealing and also we are asking from Burmese government to restore the Rohingya rights, which is ethnic rights and citizenship rights. So Burmese military have been a plan systematically to wipe off the whole Rohingya population. So what we are facing today is the last stage of genocide so uh, we need international urgent intervention to protect the lives of the Rohingya where we are receiving mass killings is going on according to uh, the information we received uh, from the ground at least 4,000 Rohingya been killed by Burmese army since August 25th and 150,000 Rohingya become IDPs two, uh, 300,000 Rohingya fled to Bangladesh so it is, we are witnessing the most horrific situation in our history. We are emergency crisis. We really need international community urgent immediate action. To so uh, if, if this continues the way it is, the whole, um, the whole Rohingyas, how, how, what is the total population of Rohingyas inside Burma at the moment? Uh, we have 1.5 million. So out of which... 300,000 fled and came to Bangladesh and perhaps 100,000 are either killed or injured so it's probably not going to be very long before everybody is cleansed this is the plan of Burmese government so that so when are when are you going to say enough is enough we want our own state when are you going to say that uh, because um, I don't want to say these things because uh, in, in the media I don't want to say anything Okay, well, but, but you, you, you understand that you'll have to stand up on your feet and face the Goliath, uh, and you don't have a choice but to do that. At some point, you'll have to do that, otherwise you'll be dead. The thing is, we need international uh, pressure to send UN peacekeeping force to save the lives of the Rohingya. This is the most important thing for now. So do you have your uh, envoys in Bangladesh and the neighboring countries uh, working? There is many Rohingya communities in Bangladesh. Also, they are. I hope they are raising with the Burmese uh, Bangladesh government. It is time for Bangladesh government to. It is time for Bangladesh government to take an opportunity to find for a permanent solution for the Rohingya issue. Because Bangladesh government been facing this crisis for many years. Because whenever it's not only 2017. In 2000, in 1978. Uh, about 275,000 Rohingya fled to Bangladesh. In 1991 and 92, 200,000 Rohingya fled to Bangladesh. In 2016, 100,000 over Rohingya people fled to Bangladesh. Currently, in 2017, at least 300,000 Rohingya have been fled. So we appreciate they giving us shelter and protection, but we are we belong to Burma. We want to get our rights in Burma. So Bangladesh government have to take effective action cooperation with international community to find out a problem another another question is the the complaint of the burmese government or the uh, people who are doing this they're saying you are bengalis and you're not burmese uh, how long is the history of rohingyas in arakan according to the history rohingyas are living early 7th century ad in arakan state Early 7th century, that is, that is probably that's when India is not yet formed. Yes, exactly. It's even before whole of India was formed. Yes. And they, they are claiming that this is not your land. They are claiming that this is not our land. Um, that's what they've been trying for many years. So this is last stage. That's what I'm saying. And, and the, the, this, is all, all, this is fully racial or there is uh, economic as well? It's a political, racial, and ethnic.
and religious persecution we are facing. Chunkin, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, hi. Uh, Could you please introduce yourself to our, uh, you're from LV24 TV. Oh. I'm Maha Azam and I'm the head of the Egyptian Revolutionary Council. Uh, we are an organization opposed to the military regime in Egypt and we believe in a civil democratic state. We've come here in support of uh, what is happening, uh, the massacres that are happening, the genocide that is happening in Burma. Uh, we want to make our voice heard in support of all those gathered here today to say that military institutions are a danger to society they have resulted in the mass murder and mass killing of innocent Muslims in Burma uh, and that ultimately we call on the British government and all democratic governments in the world to expose what is happening, to cut diplomatic ties with Burma, to ensure that uh, Aung Su Chi is, uh, is put before the International Criminal Court as well as the head of the military in Burma. Uh, we know full well that... Uh, the so Excuse me, um, how is that going to happen when there are uh, joint military exercises, or exercises happening with the American uh, military and Burmese military? Uh, society, uh, the broader civil society in Western democracies, the community here, the Muslim community with all those that stand with them in the United Kingdom and in the United States must pressure their uh, members of parliament, their governments to cut ties with the Burmese uh, government and to ensure that not in our name can these massacres take place. But, but is it, it is not only about the government, it's also about the mainstream media is not talking much about it, is, uh, are they? They will they will start talking about it if uh, the community takes to the streets, if they demonstrate, if they lobby their MPs, if they tell uh, the British government and other Western governments that uh, these massacres cannot happen in our name and that ultimately these democracies that uh, claim to uphold human rights are ultimately complicit in the murder of innocents uh, in Mina, uh, Myanmar and uh, uh, responsible for the support of the regime in Myanmar. B BBC and CNN covered the 2015 Suki election and uh, they didn't raise it for a second that uh, Muslims were not allowed to vote. Rohingyans were not allowed to vote in Burma. That is absolutely right and we have lost thousands and thousands of lives. Women have been raped, children have been massacred. It's about time the international media spoke out. Uh, they cannot ignore this genocide because if we ignore it, we will then be complicit in the future and continuing murder of innocent men, women and children. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to see if we can have a chat with Rushna Rali. Uh, we would um, senseless murder uh, and displacement of hundreds of thousands of people is not acceptable. This is the 21st century and we are seeing ethnic cleansing. Um, according to the UN, they believe that crimes against humanity uh, has, is, is um, likely to have been committed. The UN Commission of Inquiries called for an inquiry, but the Burmese government did not allow access to the investigators. The media doesn't have uh, access to the media, uh, to the investigators, um, and nor have the humanitarian agencies, and that is not acceptable, and we have to see an end to the violence. Today, um, we published a, a letter that went to Boris Johnson that was copied to the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, calling on her, uh, her government, and the, calling on the Foreign Secretary uh, to apply that pressure at the international level as well as directly without using our bilateral relations. 176 parliamentarians that I have asked to support that. We, uh, out of the parliamentarians, 176 immediately signed up to it and there'll be many others who will. Because we, as a group of parliamentarians, feel this is utterly unacceptable and it's not good enough what the international community is doing. Rushna, could I ask you a question quickly? So we need to step up and we need to see the government step up. Thank you. Oh, yeah. could, could I ask a question quickly? No, can you not do that? I 
Travis the Red No, no, I understand that. Can, he, can I take a, can I ask you a question, if you don't mind? No, you don't need to wave your finger. You can say it very politely. You don't need to wave your finger. That's not the nice way to behave, you know? I'm, I'm saying very politely. I just want to ask you a question. I'm just, I just want to ask you a question. I'm representing LP24. No, no, no. I'm not entering in the middle. No, 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 no. I'm just asking a question. Thank you very much for your time, madam. Very, very, very glad. Absolutely. You're, you're unbelievable. Um, sorry, we couldn't get an interview from Rushnara, uh, Rushnara Ali. I don't know why. Uh, but anyway, so the program is going to start very soon. And we are going to be uh, back when the speaker comes to the podium. Um, we are going to put our camera back to where it was. Thank you very much, audience, for being with us. Let's quickly take Asit. So probably still got five minutes left to for a start. So Asit, sorry. Sorry. Quick, yeah, yeah, go on. Break. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so you, you have extensive experience of visiting Burma and seeing what's happening, the atrocities, uh, and you, you have spoken to the uh, victims and the eyewitnesses. Um, why is the world media quiet about it? Why is, did not BBC raise the question of Muslim Rohingyas were not allowed to vote at the time of Suu Kyi election? Why is the American and the UK government uh, working in tandem with Burmese government? I think that, look, I, I think the media were reporting it. I think that is, is about prominence, about where, uh, where it levels, where it comes in the news agenda. Does it come at the top? Does it come at the, uh, does it come at the bottom? Does it come in, do, 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 so right now, because people are crossing the border, it's, it's at the top of the news agenda. What happens when it's not? You know, what, what happens in a month's time or a year's time or two years' time? What's going to happen? So I think... Uh, I, I think that that's an issue. I think that uh, people have been reporting. Yeah, I think uh, attention was brought to it, but what, what's going to happen in a year's time? I think that the world media is paying attention. We just need to keep the pressure up. So there, there are 1.1 million Rohingyas and there's 300,000 or approximately half a million already fled uh, to Bangladesh or 300,000 fled to Bangladesh and there were previous incidences when hundreds of thousands fled to Bangladesh. So how, how long are they going to survive? They're going to be completely cleansed out of Burma. Maybe that's the plan. Maybe that's the plan. I, I think that um, I think that the survival uh, there's a massive question mark over the future of the Rohingya in Burma. Well, what, what do you think uh, people should be doing, and what what, what are the uh, responsibilities of everyone? I, I think that the international community needs to put pressure on the Burmese government and those that support the Burmese government. I think that's what needs to happen. I think that's the only way things are going to change. When you say international community, do you, do you not mean the international governments too? I, I, I mean the British, I mean the Americans, I mean Bangladeshis, I mean every single country needs to put pressure and say we will not allow an ethnic, uh, the ethnic cleansing to continue and to take place. I think th they have to, th you know, this has to go to the top level, this has to go to the United Nations, this has to go uh, to the world governments, international community to put pressure on the Burmese to say stop what you're doing and stop it right now. Uh, my name is Asad Beg. Uh, I'm a journalist uh, from the UK. Thank you very much. So w here we hear that the plan is to completely cleanse um, Rohingyans from Burma. That's shocking. So 1.1 million people are going to face devastated fate and they're going to be killed. Many of them are going to flee to Bangladesh and the rest are going to be killed. Um, and th this is just heartbreaking and shocking and this is a shame to the humanity so people who are in Bangladesh who are across the world Muslims and non-Muslims alike they should be raising their voice and putting pressure so that doesn't happen this would be the greatest of um, genocide and killing mass murder of human beings uh, in this day and age of 21st century 
And this is uh, absolutely shocking. Uh, we will continue with the program shortly, so I'm going to leave it uh, with the microphone, the main microphone, Nafal Zamir from LMC reporting. Thank you. Will the speakers to the front, please? Can I request the members of the press and the media to please stay back a bit? Thank you. Welcome everyone. Okay, so our next speaker for the evening will be Tunkin Rofar. He is the president of the Burmese Rohingya Organization UK. Okay. Asalaamu Alaikum, my dear brothers and sisters. Thank you so much for your solidarity with Rohingya people today. We Rohingya community mourning about 40 days what we've been hearing from the ground. Before I, I talk what's happening now, I would like to give a short brief of Rohingya people history and how they've been facing persecution in Burma. So they will know, you all will know what is really happening, what is the background. You know, we Rohingya people living in Burma, early 7th century AD. We come from Mughal, Patans, Bengali, and other Arabs and others. Our population is 3.5 million. Because of continued persecution, 2 million Rohingya fled from Burma. You know, Burma got independence in 1948. The independence, we Rohingya were recognized as an ethnic group. On that time, Rohingya language was broadcasted from Burma Radio Broadcasting Program. On that time, my grandfather was a parliamentary secretary. I'm not a citizen of Burma until today. When 1962 General Nguyen coup power, he started systematic persecution against Rohingya. First, he stripped up our ethnic rights. He have stopped Rohingya language program from Burma Radio Broadcasting Program. And he introduced 1982 citizenship law, which deprived basic fundamental rights of Rohingya. Because of that law, 1.3 million Rohingyas are not citizens of Burma. After 1988 uprising, when military coup power again, in 1990, the military imposed restriction of movement, restriction on education, restriction on marriage, and confiscation of lands. That's what they've been doing. You know, we Rohingyas are not allowed to move from one village to another. If we want to get married, we need to get a pass. It takes three to five years. You can get the pass after you provide a big bribe. Rohingya students, they can't go to higher education. And Burmese military, they confiscate our lands and they kept under of military. And because of that, 
275,000 Rohingya fled to Bangladesh. I hope you all are aware about Burma after 2010, where international community so-called reform came to Burma, anti-Rohingya campaign started. Everywhere in the country, hatred against Rohingya spread up by holding seminars, by holding conference, and anti-Rohingya campaign everywhere. As a result of that hatred against Rohingya in 2012, we have seen that a state organized ethnic cleansing against Rohingya. On that time, 140,000 Rohingya become IDPs in Sitwe. Thousands of Rohingya have been killed. And then in 2015 election, the historic election in Burma, Rohingya were not allowed to vote and allowed to be a member of parliament. After 2015 election, Daung San Suu Kyi came to power. Rohingya situation became much worse. In 2016 October, there was a tax by the Burmese army under the pretext of, you know, some Rohingya youth militant attacks. They kill at least 2,000 Rohingyas. Thousands of Rohingya houses burned down. And denied Burmese government and Burmese military, they denied that is nothing happened. It didn't do any crimes. And UN documented and UN released a report in 2017, February. They found that what could amount to crime against humanity against Rohingya minority. And they established fact-finding mission last March in UN Human Rights Council, and the government is denying not to give access to this fact-finding mission. And the, gov the Burmese military, government jointly, they campaign hatred against Rohingya, more restriction for aid, and they rounded up many Rohingya villages in last few weeks before these attacks happen. As some Rohingya youth become desperate, they attack the police post and the military and government taking as a collective punishment. They are killing civilians. They are burning down Rohingya villages. They are slaughtering Rohingya men, women, and children. My dear friends, I want to point out here, because Burmese government, what they are playing a dirty tactics now is, is a kind of terrorist issue or the other way to divert what we are facing is genocide. They want to change the narrative. You know what the attacks happen? These are desperate youth groups. They attack the police post, but they can't take collective punishment. International Crisis Group, UN High Commissioner, from Geneva, they mentioned in their statement that it was predicted it could be prevented. Burmese military and government, they let it happen, you know, and they, by under the pretext of this, they can wipe out the whole Rohingya population. Since 25th October, we are receiving horrific stories from our friends, our relatives, from our kind of state. They are slaughtering our brothers, our sisters, and even three years children and five years children in front of them. Many children have been thrown to the fire and many elderly men they burned alive. We received the information from the ground at least 5,000 Rohingya have been killed by Burmese army. It's very hard to get correct information. Some sources are saying that it might be more than, than 10,000. There are about 150 IDPs since 25th August and about 300,000 Rohingya fled to Bangladesh.
30,000 Rohingya people trapped in a mountain about 14 days now in Rathay Down Township and Buti Down Township. There is no food, no shelter, no medicine for them. We are receiving the information. Many children and elderly men and women are dying day by day. We've been calling for international community to protect Rohingya people. We are advocating to the governments and other international level, uh, other government officials we have not seen so far a stronger statement until today. What we are facing today is a completely what we are facing is a genocide. According to legal, legal experts, in the past already there were, there were many reports what Rohingyas are facing genocide. What we are facing today is last stage of genocide where mass killings taking place. Bami's military killings, you know, the Rohingya men, women, and children, you know, village by village, and it's what's happening is seriously worsening. And the most horrific history, the most horrific situation in our Rohingya history, we are facing. So. What we would like to urge international community here, we are helpless people. We don't have friend inside Burma. Burmese government policy is to wipe out the whole Rohingya population. It's a systematic plan. We have 3.5 billion already Burmese government expelled. 2.5 million now, another 1 million almost left. So if international community, they don't take action, Rohingya will not be in Burma. And I believe that there will be situation much, much worse if international community will not take any action. So we need urgent UN intervention to send UN peace force to protect the lives of Rohingya. Also, I would like to request, please write to your MP, British government is training those military who are perpetrating crime against humanity, Rohingyas and other minorities in Obama. So we need your action to write to your MP to stop training these Burmese criminal militaries and to stop cooperation with Burmese military. You know, we've been speaking this, our horrific situation for many years. What we are facing is, this is the last stage. We have never seen this kind of horrific situation in our history, as I mentioned earlier. So my dear friends, we need your help. You all are our hope. We need your action. I really hope that you all will pray for our brothers and sisters in Arkan. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much, uh, Tunkhin. A perspective from inside the Rohingya community. Um, he would have spoken for long, but because of time, we had to shorten it. I really appreciate your work you do in this country, especially raise the issue and the awareness. And we are here to help you uh, as much as we can. Our next speaker is. Um, Hakan Kamuz, we've heard about the situation of other countries helping the Rohingya Muslims, Malaysia, Turkey, and other countries. We have Hakan Kamuz from the Turkan Foundation, who's the chairman there. He's also an international human rights and war criminal legal consultant. So a few words about what Turkey is doing and what we can do legally also. Hakan Kamuz. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am humbled to be amongst you today, uh, brothers and sisters, and thank you very much for uh, turning up to this event, which is important for us to share our thoughts and uh, share the pain of our brothers and sisters who are suffering in Burma at the moment. So I'm grateful to you all for being here with us today. 
I also bring greetings from Mr. Bilal Erdogan, who is one of the founding uh, members of our charity here in the UK, who is in Burma, in Bangladesh, with his mother, who is the son of President Mr. Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Uh, they are in camps for two days now, distributing aid, and they had the opportunity to speak with the Bangladeshi's Prime Minister to do more on behalf of the Turkish government. He uh, organized a few thousand tons of aid so he can reach out to those who are in no man's land cannot come into Bangladesh. The Turkish government has also offered to help Bangladeshi government in sustaining uh, a constant flow of uh, help to these people and somehow maintaining a, at least a decent uh, a place for them to stay. We have, as Turkey, a great experience in such, an act, uh, such, a, such times. As you know, in Turkey, in uh, various uh, facilities that's been organized by the Turkish government for the last six years. And uh, they wanted to reach out to those people who are suffering at the moment uh, because of what the Burmese government is doing. But there's a historical perspective which I want to tell you a story, which is a true story. There was a, uh, you know, when the whole crisis highlighted, as you know, social media, everybody talks about everything that happens. It just so happened in 1912, there was a letter by Ottoman Foreign Ministry at the time a uh, letter that talked about Burmese Muslims who wanted to give 220 pounds for those who suffered because of the wars that was going on in the Balkans at the time. And uh, Muslims in Burma, whatever it was called then, uh, Burmese Muslims, who donated uh, from, they've collected amongst them money, 220 pounds. And they gave it to the Ottoman uh, consulate who was based in Rangoon, Rangoon at the time. And the letter appeared in social media talking about how at that time, Muslims of Burma, who had the mentality to see themselves as one, Ummah, the word we all see and crave, the unity, right? But they lived it. You see, nowadays we talk about it. But at the time, they actually lived it. They sent that money for the orphans of those uh, conflict at the time. For uh, Mr. Uh, Erdogan, who actually mentioned this, the help that came, you see, in Turkey, when we're growing up, one of the things they teach you is, uh, uh, they call it Pakistan, because Pakistan didn't exist at the time, I know. But we have this understanding, and most of you probably been to Turkey, and you see how much love out there about the people of that region. Because we all taught at the time when we were going through our liberation war, people of that region collected money to help us when we were in dire need. But forgotten, and it's instilled in our, in our brains, that the people of that region helped us at the time. So it is in our character, a Muslim's character, to really help one another. We need to be like this. How they were 100 years ago, we need to be exactly like them, like our ancestors, who actually thought, like a Muslim, being one, the entire body. If one part aches, the whole body aches. You all know the, the saying of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what we are trying to do, you could actually maybe take it as a sign of treating us as one. So where we can reach out, we are. And that's what you're here for. And inshallah, today, nearly a thousand of you today, and inshallah, hundreds of thousands, millions of us out there, we will use this opportunity to get together again to do something for our brothers in Burma, like we did for our brothers in Syria. You see, we're not even talking about Syria anymore. Do you realize? Nobody's even talking about Syria, but it's still going on. You know, nowadays, if you're a Muslim, you can just get to pick who, by whom you want to be killed. Do you want to be killed by ISIS or some Assad regime here or that regime there? And it became somewhat normal, isn't it? Don't you think? It's like conflicts are going around the world, and most of them are against Muslims. And that's because this is the illness we're suffering from. Illness that we're talking about the symptoms here. Today, Burmese government, yesterday, Assad regime, a day before it was Bosnia. What tomorrow? You know, in five years' time, what are we going to talk about? We need to heal this disease and the disease of disunity. We need to be one, like how our ancestors were. Have they actually got together to say, you know, orphans in Balkans need our help, even though we are in Burma 100 years ago. Let's get together and do something for them. 
And inshallah, that's what we're here for. Half the world uh, away in Burma, suffering going on, and we're here. I see this as a good sign that there is a unity. Don't think there isn't a unity. There is a unity. We are united. You see, this hall is full of people who are united. Inshallah, this will expand and become bigger. And that's what we want to do. And in remembrance and in honor of those uh, Muslims who are my ancestors as much as yours, I am going to symbolically today, inshallah, donate 220 pounds. And I know this is not the right thing to say in our ethics to mention what you're going to do, as in uh, helping somebody, but I'm going to. Because I want to remember those people who actually did what they did. And I am going to donate 220 pounds today, just so that I can remember them. Again, it's a symbolic thing. Just don't want to you know, make an issue of it, but it is something. It's, to me, it's an important point. Because they, 100 years ago, thought of me as one of them. And I want to think of what's happening in Burma and to the Burmese Muslims, the Rohingya Muslims, as me. I am one of them, and they are, they are like me. So I want you all to think like this. And inshallah, at the end of the day today, we're going to collect some money for these people so we can all help them. I know it's uh, symbolic, isn't it? When something like this happens, we all get to get money and send money and stuff. But it matters. It's a small thing that matters. It's a small thing that you'll be doing. But it has a bigger impact in the psyche of Muslims. Because it's these little things that are going to bring us together, inshallah. So make it happen. And I ask you all to help contribute to the efforts of the brothers and sisters who actually organized today's event. And so we can all, again, unite in that little act. And by these little acts coming together, one day we will be, inshallah, achieving bigger things as Ummah. We will treat the disease of disunity. We will come together as one, as Muslims, and inshallah, we will achieve that where there is a problem in Burma, we will go and sort it out. In fact, you know what? If we actually help heal this disease, we won't even have to go there to help because there won't be a problem. Not let it happen in the first place because we will be a powerful, we will be united, and we will be one. And when we are like that, there's going to be no problems like this because we will speak as one voice. Inshallah, Allah will show us those days. And inshallah, Allah will unite us uh, uh, together, inshallah, as an ummah. Once again, ameen. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah khair and thank you so much for that. Really emphasizing the historic brotherhood and link between the Rohingya and Turkey, but also the real sense of solidarity and the real power of unity, and as one sister reminded me as I was walking out, aside from the practical steps, and things we should go home and do to also remember the power of your du'a and to remember the power of um, collective du'a. So um, our next speaker is Roshanara Ali, and she's the current MP for Bethnal Green and Bao. Good evening, everyone. Salaam alaikum. I'm going to try and keep my comments as brief as possible because there are um, very many important speakers here tonight and in particular um, I want to start off by thanking uh, my friend Tun Kin for giving you all an update in what is uh, an incredibly difficult situation. Um, thank you for your bravery. Thank you for everything that you along with many other campaign organizations have been doing and of to our organizers, to the organizations that brought us here tonight, and to the London Muslim Centre um, for hosting us. Um, we meet in incredibly pressing and challenging times, and it is with great sorrow I'm here to address you. Someone who uh, has been incredibly hopeful over many years, like all of you. We wanted to see Myanmar move towards democracy, towards freedom, towards respect for human rights, and especially including towards minorities. And our country, here in the US, British, as well as citizens around the world, people campaigned for Aung San Suu Kyi's freedom. They looked to her for hope. They looked her with optimism as a symbol of democracy, freedom, and hope. So it is with great sorrow 
that we meet today uh, at a time when, according to Yan He Lee, crimes against humanity are likely to have been committed. And this is before the recent escalation of violence that's claimed the lives of thousands of people and displaced yet more people from kind state. I visited Myanmar for the first time with the support of Refugees International and Burma Campaign in my capacity as a member of the All-Party Group on Democracy in uh, Burma, uh, which I now chair, co-chair. And I visited the country after the horrendous violence and the killings prosecuted by the military government, which displaced over, over 120,000 people at the time internally, and of course, many externally. And I saw firsthand what was happening in Sitwe, in Rakhine State, in the camps. I spent many days visiting those camps where children were dying unnecessarily, needlessly. Women were dying. This was after the violence. This was in the camps and that has been going on year in, year out. And sadly, despite the move towards democratic transition, things have not got better, they've got worse. I visited Rakhine State in February this year and made a personal appeal to the state councillor for greater action, greater pressure on the military wing of her government, and also for her to use her incredible authority, moral authority that she has in her country, where she got the vast majority of people who voted for her, and the Muslims in that country had hope to see progress in that transition towards democracy. I'm saddened that that hasn't, those, those uh, appeals from many in the international community have not come to, uh, to a great deal. In fact, the circumstances have just continued to deteriorate. We in Parliament are appealing on our government to step up and to take action against the Burmese government. But also, not only asking Aung San Suu Kyi, and rightly we should be, but also applying absolutely critical pressure on military rulers who are in charge of defense and security and are prosecuting the so-called clearance operation, which is a euphemism for ethnic cleansing. These are not my words, these are the words of human rights organizations, NGOs, the United Nations. Uh, and that's why the inquiry was commissioned, but there is, there's not been access to the investigators. So my appeal to you all is that please write to your MPs. If you are my constituents, I know I know the strength of feeling and uh, I will do everything I can to continue, continue to fight for the protection of this community. But I ask you all to also make sure that you talk to the media, tell them to apply pressure on all sides of the government of Myanmar, the military as well as the civilian-led government, and use whatever influence you have. Um, please donate, as the ambassador and the representative from the Turkish Embassy has said. Um, but also, please make sure you keep the pressure on our government. Today, I released a letter that we sent as parliamentarians, which was signed by 176 members of parliament, as well as members of the House of, House of Lords, to the Foreign Secretary and to the Prime Minister, asking that our government stop spending any money providing uh, support to the Burmese military because sadly <laughs> the training they've been given while it was meant to be well intentioned is frankly unacceptable the training which doesn't include human 
price training, um, training, spending hundreds of thousands of pounds, that needs to stop. Uh, and the our government needs to put this matter on the United Nations agenda at the General Assembly. And and our government, our government needs to stop being mealy mouth. If, if if as has been alleged by the United Nations, that crimes against humanity have been committed, let us not once again find ourselves in a situation where we see governments wringing hands after genocide has been committed, after crimes against humanity have been committed, stay in Bosnia and elsewhere, after the event, after ethnic cleansing has, been, has taken place, after people have been murdered and displaced, it should have happened never again. Now is the time for our governments to act, not just the United Kingdom, but every government around the world. So please, please, keep campaigning, keep fighting, and thank you for everything you're all doing. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you very much, Rashnan Ali, our local MP. She has been supportive of the cause for a long time, always respond to our call to come to meetings and to help us behind the scenes also. So we're grateful for your support, Rashnara. Thank you very much. We have a couple more speakers left, um, and also the, the main purpose of this evening is to fundraise. In a few moments, we'll do that, inshallah. Last time when we had this fundraising, within 25 minutes, we raised about 120,000 pounds from this very room. And the people that were here was probably half the, room, half the number. So we hope to do magic again and beat that number today, inshallah, in a few moments' time. But before that, just want to introduce to you or let you know about a flagship project from the East London Mosque. It's called Run for Your Mosque. Not run away from your mosque, run from your mosque. Or run for your mosque, <laughs> I made a mistake there. So the idea is every year we organize uh, a race uh, in Victoria Park where you get to get money, get commitment from people to raise money for a charity of your choice. So this year a lot of people are raising money for Rohingya Muslims. They'll get together on 17th of September, they'll run in Victoria Park, part of an organized race, There'll be prizes and trophies awarded at the end also. So what we're appealing to everyone here is, especially for men and boys, because this is for men and boys at the moment, you to register, go register for this race, raise money for any charity you like, but at the moment we're asking you if you can raise money for the Rohingya Muslims. It's something for you to look into. Um, it's fun, it's healthy, um, it's creative. So please take a leaflet from the back, go on the Islam Mosque website to get more details. Our next speaker, and I'll ask him to be very brief because time is really running out, uh, is Sayyid Ikhlas. Sayyid Ikhlas is a young academic. He's doing his master's in SOAS. He's a lead person for Lonely Orphans. He's also done field work in Burma. So we'll ask him to share briefly, uh, in a couple of minutes, his thoughts about the situation there. Sayyid. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. So I'll. I'll as possible. Um, one of the things that I, I've seen happen when you, when you study uh, violence, um, there's a, a numbing or cold language that comes out of stats and figures, uh, and, and that often kind of desensitizes us from uh, the, the emotional humanitarian pool that we would have uh, when we hear these things. Um, though, like in violence, there's madness, there is method in it when we see. Uh, it being state sanctioned in the case of uh, Rohingya peoples. Um, and it's important to understand the importance of uh, academia that plays in here because you would be surprised uh, the lack of uh, literature that exists uh, with regards to the Rohingya uh, issues um, in journals or in academia. And why it's important because this is what feeds policy makers uh, in their decision making when they up with uh, solutions or, or policies regarding the Rohingya people. So it's important to note that the, all of the categories of uh, an academic called Gregory Stanton has listed the, the stages of genocide. And all of these categories have fulfilled, uh, are being fulfilled by the uh, acts of the Myanmar government with the Rohingya people. And this includes the dehumanization, this includes uh, the, the mutilation of the bodies that you see that come out and the images that we see is, is to create this uh, ease of killing. 
Uh, they're, they're making a profession out of it. Uh, and it's really important that we try and get some of the young people who are choosing what subjects they choose uh, for universities to choose the kind of essays they write are relative to this, uh, to this uh, segment. Now, I think it's also important to understand that the, the, the stories that come out from, uh, you know, when, when you go out there in the field and you see what happens. I was there in 2012 where I, I saw the rhetoric of the Bangladeshi community that saw the Rohingya people as, uh, as vermin, as, as the, you know, unwanted guests, uh, you know, the, the, the invasion along the Teknaf Road. If you see how they're kept there, these people are looked at as thieves and criminals. And the same rhetoric is echoed by the Rakhine people, the, the Myanmar uh, government, which is working for both sides of the borders. It's why it's been difficult to help these, uh, the, the Rohingya people. Then you look at, you know, in 2014 we saw uh, the, the boat people. We, we started coining the term the boat people, that these people are stranded at sea. You have to look at the eyes of a man who was drinking either seawater or his own urine to quench his thirst. This is the reality of the Rohingya people. And when you see the man who, who adopted the child of his smuggler, you, you see these cases coming out in these unique situations. I, I, I had to see a father carry a child who was covered uh, in, in a lungi, uh, the, the sarong. And when they took that off, all you saw was uh, butchered limbs and burnt body. Because they managed to pull the child out in time. Now, that is the reality of the Rohingya people that are arriving at those borders. And it's really important that we support these organizations that are trying to raise these awareness because every single one of us speak a language. And we need to speak in that language and raise that awareness. We need to speak in the platform that we have available to us. And that is the social media accounts that each of you have. I mean, there's so many different generational social media differences now that we need to capture these stories and, and bring them forward in that light. Because that's the important thing here, because the, this, this uh, repetitiveness and this almost like we become frustrated, we gather and we, we walk away. But the action that every individual can take, because honestly, five years ago, I didn't know what a Rohingya was. I didn't know if it was a location or an ethnicity. Uh, and it's really important to understand the individual acts that we can do to kind of help the cause as well. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers. Thank you for inviting us. Thanks. Okay, Thank you so much for that um, different aspect, thinking about you know, the academic aspect and choosing relevant essay topics and engaging with social media, on which point Roshanara has asked um, anybody who's on Twitter to um, retweet the letter that she mentioned, um, asking MPs to sign um, if you are on Twitter to make sure you do that. So um, our next speaker is Dr. Anas Al-Tikriti, who's very influential and articulate. He is the CEO of the Cordoba Foundation. And here's our last speaker for this evening. Bismillah ar-Rahim. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'd like to thank all the organizers and the sponsors, uh, all the speakers, and particularly I'd like to thank each and every one of you who's made it to this event and filled the hall and uh, hopefully we'll stay till the very end in order to make a real contribution towards the issue that we're There's uh, so much that's been said, and um, I don't want to go over areas that we've trodden. I think that we have now come to well know uh, the, uh, the depth of despair of the Rohingya Muslims. We have gone over this several times. In this particular hall, I can count at least four or five times over the past few years. When we've come together and delayed the words of Amnesty International describing the Rohingya as the most miserable, the most oppressed. We've gone through the, uh, the graphic details of the horrific ways in which people are butchered and beheaded. Suffice to say that in any situation when parents wish death upon their own children before they are tortured, before they are raped, before they are beheaded, before they are burnt alive, suffice to say that that is a situation which is almost impossible to describe in words. Or at least I don't know the language that has the words to describe the depths of inhumanity that these people are facing on a constant basis. 
I'm going to try to touch on an aspect which I think we ought to all leave feeling very strongly about. And that is that the uniqueness of the times that we are in today is that today we actually can do something about it. In the past, when I was growing up, the best that people can do is, you know, if you have a couple of pounds or maybe if you can make dua, but today we can actually do something about it. And we've heard about steps, Mabrur has spoken so eloquently, Tonkin, Rushnara, everyone has spoken about what it is that we can do. But it's also very, very important that we also open up the context of why it is, why is it, how is it, in a world today which claims that it has arrived of human achievement, when it comes to democracy, when it comes to equality, when it comes to human rights, when it comes to respecting others, regardless of their faith, regardless of their creed, of their, their ethnicity, how is it then possible for something of the level of the butcherism that is taking place before the world's watchful eye, how is it possible that this can take place? And therefore, we come to realize that what is happening to the is merely a symptom of a graver, a deeper, a darker ailment that we all suffer from. And I mean all of us. Simply because we allow for such crimes to happen and we pacify ourselves and we pacify those who listen to us and follow us on our social accounts, social media accounts, by condemning, by expressing concern, or by making demands by follow up with actions. We need to ask a bigger question. Let us look at the world of politics that allows, not in fact allows, but manufactures conditions in which the Rohingya Muslims find themselves being persecuted in the way that we have heard throughout today. Regardless, I personally think there is a very dirty, filthy, immoral, inhumane, political, geopolitical game being played at the expense of the Rohingya Muslims in order to preserve economic and energy and trade interests of China and therefore, any kind of peace, any kind of settlement, any kind of stability would scupper or would undermine those interests. And therefore, it is in the best interest of China to maintain the violence in that particular region. And that is why China, for the very first time in over 40 years, it used its right to a veto at the United Nations Security Council when it came to a vote regarding the people of the Rohingya, condemning the crimes that is being perpetrated for the very first time since 1973. But it's not just China. Let's not absolve ourselves. It's very easy for governments to point to the Burmese government or to the Chinese government or to this government and that as though it has washed its hands of any responsibility. I will say this very clearly, and I don't know how to say it more clearly. Any government, including ours, any government that supports any military regime anywhere in the world has no ability when demanding of a particular military regime to stop committing crimes. When Boris Johnson and Alistair Burt and their mandarins in the Foreign Commonwealth Office, when they sing the praises of General Abdel Fattah Kisi, they lose any credibility to, de to demand a Burmese hunter to stop the killing of the Rohingya Muslims. When Boris Johnson meets with war criminal Khalifa Haftar in Libya and discusses with him surrendering Libya to him to become president, loses all credibility in our name, on our behalf, with our tax powers. 
we surrender all credibility to demand of the Burmese regime to stop the massacres of the Rohingya. When the world, having watched six years of horrific crimes being committed daily by the regime, to turn now to the, to the Syrian people, the millions scattered around the world as refugees, and say to them, Sorry, but you'll have to live with Bashar al-Assad because we have a problem with about 12,000 ISIS fighters. That is a world that has lost all semblance of credibility. That is a world that is now incapable of stopping any whatever it is. In fact, that is a world that has created the premise for butcherism against the Rohingya Muslims to be perpetrated. I also, as well as everyone here, here, listened with utter disbelief, shame, to the interviews of Boris Johnson and Sheikha Hasina, describing the Rohingya Muslims as well. They're people that they, you know, they need to deal with their government. It's their problem that they're being killed. It's their problem that they're being raped. It's their problem that their children are being burnt alive in front of them. It's their problem and they have to deal with it. That world that is devoid of humanity and of immorality. Look at the media. When I was traveling to East London today, two or three hours ago, I thought of checking something just for the sake of it. I thought, let me check the website of our British Broadcasting Corporation and see where the story of the Rohingya lies. I was devastated to find that it was number seven. Number seven. All this that we're talking about today, it's the story number seven. The fact that over the past two weeks, 10,000 people have been butchered. The fact that a quarter of a million people have been made homeless, and are now facing death, either by, the, by starvation or by violence. That is story number seven. Unfortunately, I have to bring you even worse news. Because a couple of hours ago, it seems that Jimmy Anderson caught his 500th test wicket in Lords. so now the story is number eight. That kind of media unfortunately reflects the same inhumanity, the same immorality that is prevalent throughout the world of politics. It is a media that is incapable. Listen, anyone who suffers and dies needlessly is a tragedy, and our hearts bleed. But it cannot be that the first four stories on every British and international website is about criminals called Irma, Harvey, and Jose. Yet we forget the criminals who are butchering people, burning them alive, raping their youngsters. It cannot be that the storms and the hurricanes of the Caribbean, as tragic as they are, take precedence of the fact that man kills man. Innocent people are being butchered in the way that we have heard. It cannot be. It cannot be. But that is where the good news starts. Because we can do something about both the politics and the media. We can do something about both. We can change the status quo. We do not have to accept what the politicians say or fail to say. Now is the time. Now is the time, and Harun Khan said it, when he said enough. Now is the time to hold every single politician responsible. I only wish that Roshnara would be here and could have stayed to hear me ask her, whilst congratulating her on her efforts, why is it that only 167 MPs signed that letter? What about the other 400? What is their stand? Do they approve of those things? Do they approve and agree and are happy with the pogroms against the Rohingya Muslims? Why is it that politicians feign empathy and broken hearts when it comes to a dark 
drowning in Louisiana or Texas or a family home losing its roof when at the same time hundreds of thousands do not have a patch of land to call theirs or a minute of safety to be able to feel the same kind of empathy and apprehension and emotions that normal human beings grow through. That is hypocrisy of the nth degree and we have to stop it. And the media, we need to flood the email accounts of every BBC producer. We need to flood the email accounts of every MP and every councillor. We need to demand of people to stand tall, stand up, speak loudly, speak clearly about how they are going to give in terms of time and effort in order to relieve the suffering of those people, probably thousands of miles away, but still human beings. My dear brothers and sisters, I think that we have all spoken enough and heard enough. Now is the time to act, to do. This is the time to perform. We've heard wonderful statements and speeches, very emotive lines being said, we've shed a tear maybe or more over the description of the massacres that are taking place, but now must come the question, now what? We're now going to see how true our feelings of empathy are through the way in which we interact with our next session. But once again, I'd like to leave you with this. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us to no degree, to no amount that we can actually imagine with the fact that today we live in times where we are not as helpless as we, as we at least thought that we used to be. Today we can do something. And any one of us who can walk ten strides in order to relieve the suffering of a human being, yet chooses to walk only eight, that is someone who has fallen short by two strides. Make absolutely sure, make absolutely sure that you save not an IO of energy. You save not a world that is inside, and you save not a penny that you can give in order to help relieve the suffering of our brothers and sisters, the Muslims, more importantly, the human beings of the Rohingya. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much, Dr. Anasat Tikriti, for wrapping up this evening's uh, formal program. The number of speeches we had from a number of dignitaries, politicians, experts, campaigners, and academics and journalists. I think this evening's discussion has been useful. We've learned a lot more about the situation in Burma. And we also have learned a lot how to, what to do, what more we can do. One of the things Brother Mabrur mentioned earlier on was to the demonstration tomorrow, that we must all go in numbers, three o'clock outside Downing Street, those of us who live in London, to show our solidarity, that we must write to our MPs, that we must raise the issue with others. It's important that we engage, not just listen. So I'm sure the next part of this program is the fundraising. Imam Abdul Masood just came in, in the hall now from somewhere else. He was caught up. He'll have about maybe 20 minutes. We're running over a little bit. About 20 minutes to see if we can raise some money uh, in a sizable way for the issue that is at, you know, at, at hand. So before he comes, I just want to thank you all for coming in such large numbers. Our distinguished speakers, our co-chair from MAB, Anika Malik, and all the supporting organizations who have helped put this program together in literally one week. We hope we don't have to meet again for such a somber occasion, but next week is really a celebration. So with this, I'll ask Imam Madhul Masru to take over. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, it is a very sad moment. Today I call the day of uh, 
morning day of grieving and I called it the Jum'ah of grieving and Jum'ah of mourning. We should all be mourning and we should not be pretending that everything is okay. Everything is not okay. Everything is not okay and can't be okay. Especially when people are being butchered, hacked to death. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that you are captured as you are running away? You're running away from persecution. Somebody captures you. Takes a knife and starts cutting off your body while you're alive. Can you imagine your gang raped? Your body parts are sliced off. Your throat slit. And then petrol doused on you and you're put to fire. Can you imagine a plight of a people like that? I can't. Can you imagine... A pregnant mother who is cut, whose stomach is slit open and baby is torn and kicked until death and the mother is also shot dead or her throat is slit. Can you imagine the plight of a people who have suffered not one day, not two days? In fact, ladies and gentlemen, when I was a young, very young lad, 17 or younger than that, 14, 15, I used to read novels that used to depict the plight of the people of Arakan. I remember those days feeling very angry and frustrated by the failure of the international community to put an end to this miserable state of people. It is not acceptable, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, that our, our foreign secretary says to Aung San Suu Kyi she should use all her marvelous qualities to bring an end to this. It's not good enough. What we need is stronger and robust condemnation. How can you ask Aung San Suu Kyi to do anything when she is an accomplice to this genocide and murder? And we need to say what needs to be said. We cannot do business with people who are mass murderers. I'm not here to tell you what you should be doing and what you should not be doing. I've cried enough. Entire Friday sermon today, I gave at my mosque and I couldn't speak because of overwhelming feeling of wanting to cry, lament at the world and its failure to see what's going on. What will you say? What will you say when you'll be asked the same question? And I came to you hungry, I came to you destitute, I came to you thirsty, but you turned me away. Ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't that long ago when in Sudan, the problems faced by the southern communities of Christian people became the reason why Sudan was annexed. I wonder if those people of Rohingya were Christians, what would have been the reaction of the world? I wonder what would have been the reactions of the world community, especially leaders of the world. You know, as far as I'm concerned, whether you're Muslim or you're Christian, whether you're Buddhist or you're Hindu, your human rights, your dignity, and your honor must always be preserved. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not the experience of the Muslims in Rohingya, in Rakhine State. I know Mabrur has spoken about his work. Human Appeal is doing an amazing amount of work on the ground. But just doing work, just words, for us here is not enough. You know, there is one brave person still in this world who can speak. They are Erdogan, right? He's spoken, not only spoke, he sent his wife to the forefront. Dave Erdogan didn't speak, he sent his wife to the forefront. And I was watching a video, hugging another lady. She looked like a human, hugging another human, crying that human, saying, I am with you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are with the people of Bahrain. We are with the people of Ranga. We are with them, even though we are in England today. Let that be understood loud and clear. You know... We cannot bring this world to a peaceful and contented state unless we end the world's misery and unfairness and injustices. And I'm here to remind you that as Muslims and people of faith and no faith and other faiths, we have one intrinsic value in which we all unite. And that is we demand all human beings and their rights to be preserved and protected. And we unite on that basis. And that's why you're here today. What about the Rohingya people? What about their rights? Well, the demand will continue. Demonstrations will continue. We will scream and shout. But I can't close my eyes and imagine it's not happening. 
four years ago when I went to Bangladesh. In the middle of the night, I avoided Bangladeshi government's detection and went to the Rohingya camps. They were waiting outside my hotel room. They won't allow me to leave. But I went. And I saw with my own eyes. You know what, ladies and gentlemen? 160,000 refugees have joined them. When I went there four years ago, those people who were living in those camps were burrowing under the earth. They didn't have a home, they didn't have a house. They were sheltering in caves to protect themselves and their families and their loved ones. 160,000 more have joined. What will they do? What will they do? And what can Bangladeshi government do with their meager resources, as I'm told? But you know what? You are not poor. How many of you had no breakfast this morning? How many of you had no lunch this morning, uh, this, this lunchtime? And how many of you will or have already had your dinner? There is no way you can say I will not have because somebody has kicked me out of my own house. You'll have somewhere to go to. Keep that in mind. When you stand for prayers, your prayers useless. Your hajj is useless. Your fasting is useless. If you can't stand for the rights of preserving the lives of people. <laughs> what good is your hajj? What good is all of this? If we can't save lives. Of course we'll pray. Of course we'll do hajj. Of course we'll fast. But we'll save lives too. We'll save lives. And I want you to save lives right now. I know some of you are thinking, oh, he's going to fundraise. Yes, I'm here to fundraise. I'm here to take all your money, not for myself, but for the crying man, woman, and children of Rohingya. When they're crying, say, Allah, please send somebody who can save us from these people who are oppressing us. Send somebody who can help us and rescue us from this plight. I'm asking you to do that today. The least you can do is give some money. Least you can do. Least you can do. So, I'm going to do an open bidding right now. I don't know how much I should start at. Five? Five? Ten? He says only. Who would like to give your brothers and sisters in Rohingya 10,000 pounds tonight and save those refugees who are going to be on the brink of starvation in Bangladesh, in the camps? That's where work is being done. That's where we can reach. Is there anyone here who would like to be brave enough to make that commitment and say, I will give that thousand pounds or I'll raise it for the sake of Allah, for the sake of humanity to save more lives. I'm looking for the first person, the bravest person in this room. We have one person over there. Takbir! Allahu Akbar! Takbir! Allahu Akbar! Allah bless you my dear brother. We have 10,000 at the back. I need a few more hands tonight. Come on, show your strength. Show your solidarity. Show that you care. Show that the lives of those Rohingya people matter. I have one 10,000. Surely we have a few more. Can we have a, two more hands of 10,000? Is there anyone here who can give 10,000 pounds towards saving the lives of those people in Rohingya? Remember what Allah says. Whoever takes one life, man qatala nafsin bighayri nafsin al-fasadin fil ard, faka'annama qatala nasa jami'ah. Whoever saves a life, wa man ahiyaha, faka'annama ahiyaha nasa jami'ah. If you save a life, it is so you save the lives of the entire humanity. Do we have anybody else who wants to join my wonderful brother? Allah bless him, say ameen. ameen. Allah give him hayatan tayyibah, say ameen. And may Allah rise him in highest of paradise, say Ameen. With us and people of our kind, say Ameen. Brothers and sisters, do we have a second person who would like to give 10,000 pounds for the sake of Allah? For today, we have a 10,000 pounds over there. Takbir! Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! Come on, brothers and sisters. Takbir! Don't be scared. Don't be scared of saying Allahu Akbar. Some people may have hijacked Allahu Akbar, but our Allahu Akbar never gets hijacked. Right? Yes. So we've got two people giving 10,000 each. Allahu Akbar! Allah bless my brother or sister whoever has given 10,000. We've got 20,000 in the room. I'm looking for one more hand of one more brave person who can give 10,000 pounds or raise 10,000 pounds for their friends and their family. Make a commitment, you can raise it. 10,000 pounds I'm looking for. One more hand of a 10,000 pounds tonight. Look, let's see if we can get one more. Don't be, don't be scared. Your money is not going to go with you. Your money is not going to go anywhere. It's going to stay even when you're gone. If you make it useful, on the day of judgment, it will be useful for you. When you're gone, the world will remember you for saving lives. And your lives will be saved when you are in need. I'm looking for a third hand at 10,000 pounds. Anyone else with 10,000 pounds, I'm looking for one more hand. I've got two so far. 
10,000 once. I'm only going to ask twice. 10,000 twice. Ladies and gentlemen, Allahu Akbar. We have. We have somebody, mashallah, Allah, whoever this person is, you'll be very happy to know. One person, without name, from our audience here right now, has given 15,000 pounds. Takbir! Allahu Akbar! Takbir! Allahu Akbar! Allah bless them, say Ameen. Ameen. Allah give them hayatan tayyibah, say Ameen. Ameen. Allah rise them in paradise, say Ameen. Ameen. You know what, brothers and sisters? Sacrifice. When we give our money, that's what, we mean. that's what Allah means, give your money first. Because giving money is difficult. Who is going to be the next person giving a 10,000 final call for tonight? 10,000 pounds going? Gone. Okay, let me halve that money and say who would like to give 5,000 pounds, inshallah, for the sake of Allah, to save those people in Rakhine, in Rohingya, who are in the camps in Bangladesh. Give them some food. Give that lady who has witnessed her son being butchered. Give that brother who has witnessed his own sister being raped. Give that family a bit of money and a bit of help and hope. 5,000 pounds I'm looking for. Who would like to start at 5,000 pounds? I've already got. We have already got 35,000 pounds in the room. Let's see if we can get up to 100,000 pounds tonight from you, inshallah. From all of us, we want 100,000 if we can. 5,000 pounds I'm looking for. One hand to go up straight into the air and say 5,000 pounds, inshallah, I'm, I'm going to give. 5,000 pounds, you make a promise, you raise it, inshallah, we have. Takbir! Allahu Akbar! Takbir! Allahu Akbar! Allah bless my dear brother over there, say Ameen. Allah give him hayatan tayyibah, say Ameen. Allah increase us all in our strength to give more, say Ameen. 5,000 pounds I'm looking for. Anybody else? We've got one 5,000 pounds over there. Anybody else with 5,000 pounds? 5,000 pounds, we need at least three hands like that. We've had three people giving more than 10,000 pounds each. Alhamdulillah, I need three people to give five each. We have one who is going to be the next person giving us 5,000 pounds. My brothers and sisters, 5,000 pounds, you need 10 friends to give you 500 each. And all of you have 10 friends here. All of you have 10 friends each. You can come together and say, I'm making a promise for my family. For my business, for my friends, I'm going to give 5,000, inshallah. And that's what I'm looking for. Somebody else to come forward. I need two more hands. I'm not going to move on. Two more hands at 5,000 each, inshallah. 5,000, I'm looking for. I've got one so far. Don't sit there and think if I give, money will deplete from my account. Don't sit there and think I will not be able to earn that money. Don't sit there and think I will not be able to go to my holiday or go to Bangladesh or wherever I come from or my parents come from. Allah will give you more. Allah will open the doors that you can have never imagined. I'm looking for 5,000 pounds more. Who would like to give 5,000 pounds? I'm going to ask three times. If you're not responding, I'll move on. 5,000 pounds once. 5,000 pounds twice. You know, brothers and sisters, what they're witnessing today, what they're experiencing in Rakhine State under the brutality of those people is beyond description. Those video footage that you have seen are snippets is not even a scratch on the surface of the brutality being brought to those people. 5,000 pounds will give hope, a home, food, and a future for a family. Families, one. Several families. Anyone else would like to join? 5,000 pounds. 5,000 pounds. Anybody else? 5,000 pounds. Allah, 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 my dear brother. Allah, give him hayat and tayyib. Say, Ameen. Allah, increase him in his iman and amal. Say, Ameen. Allah. From Finzer Mosque, mashallah, we have a mosque pledging 5,000 pounds. We have masajids here. We are in a mosque right now. We need pledges from the masajids who are sitting around too. As you can see the mosque leaders around. If you come from a mosque, put your hands up, raise the money. I make an appeal, inshallah, my dear brother, at the masjid when I come towards the end of the month. But if you raise it before, alhamdulillah, brothers and sisters, you raise the money from the public. You tell them, I gave Jum'ah today at Palmer's Green Mosque. 